Welcome to the Thelma Podcast Life Story Channel. This is the last part of a three-part interview with John Robertson about his memories of the music scene in and around Edinburgh, 1960s to the present day. John returns to the studio with more stories. We hear about his band, the Saracens, playing the Top Story Club, a marathon five-hour gig at the assembly rooms in George Street, playing the Waverley Market, seeing the small faces and the trogs at McGoo's. There's also Alan Price's unusual backstage warm-up routine. Great stories of rock and roll. We hope you enjoy. You know, you you were the warm-up band, and you would play songs, and yeah, I think we spoke to all of them. Tell you who else there was, so there was Brian Auger, there was, and it's a lot later, Mungo Jerry. Now that would, I don't know if that was 15, 20 years ago. Dave D, without Beaky McIntosh, he was a nice guy, he was a, quite a tall bloke, ex-policeman I believe. And I mentioned the Merseys, Alex Harvey. I remember the bass player there had his top string missing. <laughs> he still, I don't know if that was a money thing or he'd just broken it, but he played. So he, only had, the th- he had only the three strings. Well, I mean, as a bass player, if Alex Harvey, good band though it was, it wasn't particularly musically demanding, I don't think. They were no. quite noisy. Who else? I'm trying to think now. The only other... There were two other stories to tell you, one of which nowadays I'm a little bit ashamed of. In the Moonrakers, there was a a young guy, a little bit overweight, and he used to hang around the band. I think he, a little bit of reflected glory or whatever. He used to lift their gear, which we would take advantage of, putting it into a band, taking it into the hall setting up. Because he'd been doing this for so long, one of the Moonrakers said, would you like to do a song? His name was Robert, that's all I know. And that would be 1965. We were playing at the top story, so he jumped at the chance. And then there was was girls round the front screaming. I mean, we told them we're going to get Robert up, and they knew Robert. So Robert, we started to play Wild Thing, and what Robert did was, when he got a microphone, as he sang Wild Thing, he would he would do that. He would point, and un, unbeknown to him, the girls screamed. But I think not so much out of pity, but just for a laugh. Well, poor Robert, he thought he was... He suddenly, you know, I'm, and this is what I'm ashamed of. Anyway, that's not the end of the story. No. It was about a half metre high stage, and on the stage there was another little stage for the drummer, so that when he sat down, the whole band would look as if we were on the same level. So Robert did his wild thing, couple of verses, then there's a guitar solo, it's the same in every song, pretty much. So he looked around, and I don't know if the drummer beckoned him, but he got up onto the the drum stage, a little bit higher, and he, he grabbed a stick and he started lashing the cymbals as we were playing. Now, we were all nearly couldn't play for laughing, but unfortunately what happened was he hit the cymbal so hard that the stick bounced out of his hand. He reached forward to grab it, forgetting he was up half a metre, and he went flat right down on his face. I, th- I think that was the last time we saw the guy. Whoosh. I mean, he went from hero, as they say, to zero in a few seconds, with the girls screaming as he was pointing, singing wild thing, up on the stage, flat down. The other, oh yes, the Trogs. That was another band who played, and... What I remember from that was in that was in Magoo's. Anyway, they had these suits that looked like pajamas. They were white or cream with sort of coloured stripes in them. Reg Presley, the singer, as he was singing, he was reaching down to the girls at the front. <laughs> he must have reached too far because next moment he was off the stage and on the floor. <laughs> where we were standing at the side watching this. He managed to scramble back up. It was quite a high stage, and his suit was utterly filthy because of it. So that was quite enjoyable. Another, it was the small faces I'd forgotten about them. I can remember wondering where they got their really large guitars from. But of course, they were so small they made the guitars look big. It was Steve Marriott was singing. He was at a microphone near the front of the stage and a girl managed to get up right in front of him. She grabbed him and started running off, picked him up and started running off stage with him as he had his guitar around his neck. But there were bouncers there, so they separated him and put him back on again. Yeah, you wouldn't believe it if you didn't see it. But that's, <laughs> that's fantastic. That was story. what happened. Now, on, on my list, the last thing uh, that I was going to say it might sound quite embarrassing, but when I played in my in the band I played with for for the longest, a band called Allegretto, we were playing out at what's that big hotel? This is you're leaving Edinburgh, Christophen something house hotel. It was a winter's night. By the time we came out and finished, all the cars were frosted up. And one of the band, and it wasn't me, so there were only three left. (laughs) The back of his car was all frosted. He didn't have a scraper. 
So he stood back and peed on it <laughs> to clear the back windscreen. But uh, <laughs> it, but it narrows it down somewhat. It's nice that you mentioned Top Story. Top story. The Top Story. Yeah, yeah, which is these clubs when you were, like the Top Story when uh-huh. you went into the Top Story, which was on Leith. Street, is that? Le- that's right. Was that on the upper level? Oh, yeah, Street? you had four stories to climb up with your gear and bring it back down again. Great. And you would be, you might be making half a dozen, four, five, six journeys lifting stuff. And in those days, compared with nowadays, the gear was much bigger and much heavier. Don't, don't think I could manage it now, but we did then. And if you were playing there, how many would there be quite a few bands on? You might be sharing with another band. Um, that was quite often the way. You would do an hour or so, then another band, then you'd go back on, and then they would. And that might be at two separate hours. Not always. Sometimes you would do the whole night, take half an hour or 20 minutes off in the, in the middle. It, it meant that the management had to pay only one band if you could do the whole night. I'm trying to think. Was it Brian Waldman used to run these places? Uh, I don't know the name of his agency, but he seemed to be one. And I'm trying to think. In Princess Street, the international, Jimmy Rocho. Does that name mean anything? I've heard the name. Yeah. Well, he would be in the... It was actually on Princess Street. Yeah. I can yeah, remember I mean, that. Yeah. Played there a few times, I suppose. I've forgotten some of the places. Pete, my old keyboard player, is very good in these things. He'll right. say, do you remember when we did... And I'd say, well, no, I didn't until you've reminded me. We did, ah, thousands of gigs. How many nights a week would you be doing? Well, you would, normally it would be two, maybe Friday and Saturday. I think I said the last time, the most we ever did was five on the trot. And that last night, I couldn't sing the second half. I just, yeah. the voice had gone. Talking about voices, Alan Price, whom we played with in Magoo's, before he went on, he would, for a good while, I think it was only the ones we played, but I was surprised he, at the back of the stage, all he did was shout for 20 minutes before he went on to roughen up or to maybe to loosen his voice but I think it was to roughen it to make it rough something I'd never known before or since you would think because most people try and preserve yes the voice but he was the opposite oh. he was he was shouting and yelling and so that when he went on either it was either to loosen or roughen his voice I don't know which <laughs> very good though good player oh, yeah, Alan Price yeah. Price is older than I am so yeah, maybe he's not he doing is. all that much playing there no, no. I mean two hours if you if you were the only bad two hours is quite a long oh, well, if, if if you were the only band, you would maybe be playing three hours, maybe even four. In fact, I can tell you one. Remember playing what they used to call a pickup band in the assembly rooms, and we had to play nine until three with an hour off in the middle. That's five hours. And what used to happen at the break, they didn't want the music to stop, so the guitarist and bass player would play, and then the drummer and keyboard player would play just to keep a background sound. I mean, you, they could have put records on yeah. or something, but you would be playing nine until three. I mean, it wasn't all that energetic. We weren't jumping around the stage no. or in, but you were still standing and playing. In fact, another funny thing that comes to mind when when um, when I played in the in the clubs, the miners' clubs with Morris, the blind keyboard player, the really good player. We would be doing two nights a week from what eight till eleven with a break in the middle. But at Christmas and New year and also the trades holidays you would do two weeks and you would be playing either every night or five nights and you would also do an extra hour or half hour at the end and 10 minutes into the extra time your fingers would get sore or the voice would it was as if you were accustomed to doing a very specific length of time if you did any more and that was where the tiredness crept in there was one bonus it tightened up the band you found when you went back after it you thought well I thought we were okay before but we're really tight now just doing the extra playing it's like maybe a footballer training if you train extra hard you'll be able to run for longer and that I can remember specifically thinking after we did these extra times and, and days that you as it where what we call tightened up yeah, yeah. became really sharp there must have been times when uh, there must have been certain gigs you must have thought I don't want this to end this is going oh, oh so yes well. yes there um, I, I don't know if I can think of a specific one there were nights where you thought that was what you would describe as inspired and you'd have been happy to play on yeah in fact now that I think in it remember playing in oh dear halfway up Scotland there's a big hotel now I can't remember the name of it it's a ski resort Oh, right, like Aviemore. Aviemore, yeah. Right. We were playing in Aviemore, mm. and that was a really good night. So the organiser said, could you play another hour? And I said, if the money's right. So we got double the money for that night. We played an extra hour. We were asked again, 
at the end of that hour, could you play another hour? And I said, well, the money's got to go up again. So we had a quick talk and I said, how much? I said, let's try for double the whole lot. So we said, well, look, this by this time it's three in the morning or two in the morning and maybe play till three. We'd have been playing till 12, one, did an extra hour, maybe till one. Maybe it was only two. I don't, but we'd all the way to get back yeah, yeah. that night. So we did the extra hour, we got double money, that was fine. So we tried double again and they didn't come back to us. So I thought that's, so we cleared our gear and they came up and said, right, go. And I said, <laughs> I said look, by the time we get gear set back up again, we could have got four times the rate. If I remember driving home, I wasn't driving, it was another friend of mine, drummer, and he was falling asleep at the wheel as he was driving. And I was sitting, punching him, saying, wake up. <laughs> Coming into Edinburgh, I could see his head nodding and I'm punching him, saying, please, don't crash. Don't. In fact, there was another night, yeah, playing in Bathgate and the keyboard player had crashed his car on the way to the gig. One of his kids' little play balls had got stuck under the, the brake and he couldn't stop. Anyway, he was able to get to the gig. In order to get going again, his brake was jammed and uh, an old friend, the saxophone player, Bill Heap, said, listen, so there's a microphone stand with a bo- heavy ball end and he said, just give me a... I'll bang it with this. Now, this is at three in the morning and it's absolutely silent, the whole district. And he stood, so he gave it up and there was a hell of a clang as he hit this thing. Didn't clear it. And he finished up swinging it like a golf club and walloping it it was so loud but that took that took about a couple of hours so we all we all hung around as i was driving home it must have been about four between black hall and crew toll i was aware that i was not 100 percent. and at one point i could remember waking up driving on the wrong side of the road okay at that time there's nobody around but you just needed one car boy did that wake me up but i found even getting into ferry road i was nodding off again <gasps> So nothing untoward happened, but it could so could have easily have. Oh, so that was a lucky one. With the wrongs, and it's it's a road with islands in the middle. I could have right. hit an island. Yeah, yeah. So I must have drift drifted off, gone to the right, woke up with a <laughs> and that boy. Let me tell you, that woke me up. Great. But as I say, another couple of minutes, and I was nodding yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> so long, long nights, basically. Oh yeah, some of them. Some of them were were really late. Um, what was the furthest away you went for a gig? The band was called Allegretto. I don't know why that was. We once played over the border into England, a mile or so into England. And Pete, my keyboard, said, we'll have to change the band's name. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we'll have to call ourselves Allegretto International. So <laughs> that was his show. No, the furthest ever we played was the RAF base up at Lossiemouth. And that was another late night. You finish at three, we stayed overnight somewhere, and up at nine o'clock in the morning, oh, and then you had to drive from Lossiemouth down to Edinburgh, which must have taken, I don't know, four or five hours. So yeah. you're wrecked after that. Yeah. Wrecked. You probably won't miss that part of it. I no. Mean. No, I mean, I would do it now from from a nostalgic point of view, if mm. I could. But these occasionally, if that's where the gig was, you just you just had to go. I think I only ever played once in Glasgow for some right. reason, but played in Fife, around about the centre of Scotland. St Andrews, I remember playing at for some reason. Lossiemouth was, I think, the absolute furthest, apart from our international gig in, in England. <laughs> and in those early days, you must have been going, to, if you had transport going to gigs, it must have been... I would imagine battered old cars. Oh, were... tell me about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, well, in fact, now I remember another one. We, we had a, a transit van, and the only seat I could get in it was right at the back and with gear all around. And I didn't know I suffered from claustrophobia until that moment because when the van's clo- the back door closed, I think I was able to open it and said, I, I can't sit here. And uh, it's claustrophobic. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you think, if I had to get out of here, I couldn't, and yeah. that's when the panic set in. So yeah, yeah. I burst the back door open and said, "I would." Aw- that was from Bilson, Bilson oh. Glen. Yeah. I said, "If if I have the choice, I'll walk home." But I couldn't sit, in the- and in fact, it got me the front. <laughs> I think it got me the front seat. But I panicked when the door was shut. Gear was almost over your head, oh. right, and you were stuck yeah. in a sort of square foot of space or so. And uh, I didn't like that. No, no. So I discovered something about myself that night. Yeah. And as you say, all this endless humping of stuff. Oh, I lived in gear. Well, yeah. we were, I don't know, it must have been about 20 or 19 or something like that. But at that age, you've got some strength and yeah, you've yeah. got the, the anticipation of doing a gig, etc. Yeah. But that was the downside. Getting into what was eventually called Nicky Tams was the place, it was called the place. And outside there, you were up three flights. It was just a metal stairway with with just rails 
And at the end of the gig, there was no light at the back. You were almost feeling your way down, carrying stuff on a metal staircase three flights up. Jeez. I don't know how people didn't fall over that. Uh, I mean, we because we'd played there so often, you knew what you had to do, but they didn't even have a light out the back. So you're lifting this gear down, rusty sort of metal staircase. Whoa. Wouldn't, it would be health and safety now. You just would yeah, not yeah. be allowed to do that. But this is 50-odd years ago, so change yeah. days. And that, that the top. Story that was four, four or three. Three stories. or I'm not sure. Three or four. It might well have been four. So how big was it inside? What was the sort of capacity well, for? It that? was a, from what I can remember. It was really quite a. It was it was like a warehouse store. It was a oh. big area, and they were able to build a reasonably big. It was, I mean, it was a series of boxes clamped together to make a stage. In fact, I think they still do that nowadays. It's almost a box or of a flat board with adjustable legs, and that and the and also to be able to have a drummer's. Extra state, that's where Robert, right. to my shame, yeah. laughing at it, fell off. Yeah. But, I mean, the health and safety, oh, yeah. nowadays, yeah. There were, I don't know about fire exits, anything like that. And people were smoking as well, Oh, God, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Smo- I told you, you with, the, with the string, you would stick your cigarette in that and it would wave about. That's when I, I smoked. That, no. Yeah, they were smoking, drinking. I don't know if there'd be any food. And the place was more than... Because it wasn't well... They used to paint the inside these places black, but I think that meant that the dirt didn't show quite so much. It must have smelled. The toilets would not have been particularly great. No, no. I'm quite sure they wouldn't have been good, but that that's how it was. Yeah, that's how it... Yeah. And did you ever play, was it Waverley Market? Yes, I? yes. Oh, no. <coughs> Peter J and the Jaywalkers. And The Pretty Things. Oh. 1964. The animals were supposed to turn up. Their House of the Rising Sun had just hit the big time, so I don't know whether they didn't bother. I think The Pretty Things were put in, in place of them. But Peter J and the Jaywalk. I don't know if that's a name yeah, you yeah, means heard anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And The Pretty Things, which in those days, because they had long hair and fancy clothes but they were musically speaking they weren't up to terribly much but they were a name they look good <laughs> yeah well they look different from us <laughs> yeah, I have yeah. to say I can't remember the name of the singer he was sort of well or in those days relatively well known just even speaking to you has reminded me of these things yeah that's right we really mark it yeah, yeah. It's all changed now, of course. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I take it it was a market at the time, yeah. but that was a huge place. Mm. In fact, I think there were maybe three different stages, and then you got to do it. As soon as you were finished, the next band went on, and as soon as they were yeah. finished, so I think there were three. That would be 1964, pretty accurately. You were there early on, weren't you? Oh, yes. Rock and roll. And- yep, it was the... In fact, I don't know if I told you this last week, but uh, the BBC had a, a BBC... This is before Radio 1. It must have been the light programme. They had a programme, I think it was. It might have been called Meet the Beatles. They would play some of the songs that they'd written, but they would. They also, on one occasion at least, they played the record that they were going to release the next day. It was possibly live, but what somebody in the band, and that was the Saracens, did, he recorded it, and we had a rehearsal that night, and we were able to play the new Beatles song. <laughs> the... On the day it was released, that was quite an enterprising thing to that do, was, don't you think? It? That was very good. Yeah. So it happened definitely once, possibly twice. But as I say, the Beatles, it was a BBC programme with the Beatles or Meet the Beatles yeah, or yeah. someone like that. Yeah. And they had this, this programme so that and Paul or John would say, here's our, here's our new song being released tomorrow. Thank you for listening to our Life Story podcast. Please check out our other podcasts, Leith Lives, The Thelma Tapes, Analog Roar is Jukebox, and Forgotten Songs from the Broom Cupboard. All these can be found on popular podcast platforms such as Apple Podcast, Spotify and Deezer. Also via our website www.livingmemory.org.uk Or we have two Facebook pages, one for the Living Memory Association and the other for Thelma Podcasts. If you have a story or a memory you'd like recorded, please contact us via our website. Once again, thanks.